1953B students. This video is about the mechanism of transcriptional activation with a focus on one of the best studied transcriptional activators known to humankind, that being E. coli CRP, the cyclic AMP receptor protein. Two questions can be asked about regulatory factors such as CRP. First, how do they recognize their binding sites? And the short answer to that question is that they use helix turn helix motifs, which bind the major groove. The second question that we can ask is the one that will be the main focus of this video. That is, how do regulatory factors such as CRP communicate with RNA polymerase? In other words, how do they send a message to RNA polymerase that it's time to transcribe the promoter? The short answer to that question is that they do so through direct protein-protein interactions between the regulatory factor and RNA polymerase. Here we see the structure of CRP bound to the CRP site from the LAC operon. And like most bacterial transcription factors, it binds to DNA as a dimer. We see two identical subunits, one in blue and the other in green that come together via a dimerization interface. Each subunit has a recognition helix as a part of a helix turn helix motif that binds in the major groove of the DNA. We can also see cyclic AMP bound to each subunit. CRP only binds the DNA when it's bound to cyclic AMP because the cyclic nucleotide induces a change in the conformation of CRP that's essential for DNA binding. Highlighted in different colors, we see a total of four regions, two on each subunit, that function as activation regions. In yellow, we see AR1, which stands for activation region 1, and in red, we see AR2, or activation region 2. These were defined by a genetic analysis. In particular, scientists heavily mutagenized CRP and looked for mutations that prevented activation without preventing binding to DNA. We call such mutations positive control mutations. They don't block DNA binding, but they nonetheless block the ability of CRP to activate transcription. So mutations in AR1 prevent activation without blocking DNA binding. They therefore define a surface in ARP that is required for activation. This led Richard Ebright and his colleagues to address the following question. Could AR1 interact directly with RNA polymerase to stimulate transcription? They proceeded to address this question by chemically probing the interaction between CRP and RNA polymerase in a so-called label transfer experiment. Here's the idea behind the experiment. First, AR1 was attached to a transferable label. Then the transfer of the label onto RNA polymerase was induced. The label was designed in such a way that transfer can only occur if these two protein surfaces are in direct contact with one another. So if label transfer is observed, then you've proven that this contact occurs. To make it possible to label CRP, the protein was modified by the introduction of a unique cysteine residue into AR1. The reagent shown here, then, could be used to label AR1. The reagent's full name is rather long, so I'll just call it IAC. It contains this thiopyridine residue connected via a disulfide bond to a modified salicylate residue. There are two important modifications to the salicylate residue. First, we have this azido group, and second, we have an iodine substituent. The iodine that's installed here is I-125, which is radioactive, and so this asterisk just means that we have a radioactive isotope of iodine. Now, the CRP and IAC are mixed together with one another, and under the correct reaction conditions, disulfide exchange will occur. In other words, the SH group on the cysteine residue in AR1 will attack one of the sulfurs in the disulfide bond in IAC, replacing one disulfide linkage with another, thus producing a radio-labeled form of CRP. 
So now what Ebright and co-workers wanted to do was to try to transfer this label to RNA polymerase and in that way prove that when CRP and RNA polymerase are bound to the promoter, AR1 is in direct contact with some portion of RNA polymerase. One thing that's left out of this scheme is that these two proteins are bound to the LAC promoter. So CRP is bound to the CRP site in the LAC promoter and RNA polymerase is bound to the promoter itself. Then, irradiation with UV light induces a reaction involving the azido group. As shown here, irradiation of the azido group results in the cleavage of a nitrogen, nitrogen bond with the release of diatomic nitrogen, leaving this so-called nitrine group behind. A nitrine is electron deficient. Notice that there are only six electrons in the, in the nitrogen atom's valence shell. So this is a very potent electrophile, and it's going to grab electrons wherever it can find them. If it's bound in close proximity to RNA polymerase, it will attack some nearby atom X on the RNA polymerase and form a covalent bond to complete its valence shell. At this point, we've cross-linked CRP to the RNA polymerase, but we haven't yet transferred the label. To complete the transfer, we need to break the linkage between CRP and the labeled residue. To do that, we need to reduce this disulfide bond by adding DTT. So Richard Ebright and colleagues carried out this experiment and then looked to see whether they had indeed transferred the label to RNA polymerase. Here is a simplified picture of the result they obtained. They isolated the RNA polymerase after carrying out this series of reactions and ran it out on an SDS polyacrylamide gel to separate the subunits. They then stained the gel with a dye called Kumasi Blue, allowing them to visualize all the RNA polymerase subunits, including beta prime, beta, sigma, and alpha. Then, to see if any of these polypeptides were radioactive, they placed the gel in contact with X-ray film. After a suitable exposure period, the X-ray film was developed, revealing a black band wherever it was in contact with a radioactive polypeptide. What they saw was that the label did transfer to RNA polymerase, and in particular, it transferred to the alpha subunit. In further experiments, they broke the alpha subunit into N and C terminal domains and showed that the label was bound to the C terminal domain, or CTD. So in conclusion, when CRP and RNA polymerase are bound to the LAC promoter, AR1 makes a direct contact with the alpha subunit CTD. This leads to the so-called recruitment model. The idea is that when CRP is bound to the CRP site and RNA polymerase is bound to the promoter, there is an energetically favorable contact between AR1 and the CTD of the alpha subunit. This contact lends extra stability to the RNA polymerase promoter complex, and so according to the jargon in the field, CRP recruits RNA polymerase to the promoter. The next thing we need is to address the functionality of the contact that Ebright and co-workers demonstrated between AR1 of CRP and the RNA polymerase alpha subunit CTD. So far, based on what I've told you, all we know is that the contact occurs. We don't really know that that contact is required for transcriptional activation. So here is an experiment that measures the functionality of that contact. This is an in vitro transcription experiment published a while ago by Igarashi and Ishihama that used a mixture of two different promoters, the LAC wild type promoter and the LAC UV5 promoter. Remember, the only difference between these two promoters is that the LAC wild type promoter contains a non consensus Pribnow box, while the LAC UV5 promoter contains a consensus Pribnow box. They also altered the two templates in such a way that transcription of the wild type template gave rise to a longer transcript than transcription of the LAC UV5 template. This allowed them to separate the RNA products resulting from transcription of the two templates by gel electrophoresis. 
The reactions contained either wild-type RNA polymerase or RNA polymerase from which they had removed the alpha subunit CTD. Reactions were carried out either in the presence or absence of the cyclic AMP CRP complex. If we look at the result of transcribing the LAC UV5 promoter, we see that CRP is not required for efficient transcription from this promoter. That should be no surprise to you because remember that the LAC UV5 promoter has a perfect consensus Pribna box. So it's a very strong promoter and RNA polymerase can recognize it without any help from CRP. In contrast, the wild type LAC promoter has a bad Pribna box, ensuring that it will not be transcribed without CRP. This in turn ensures that transcription of the LAC operon will only occur in the absence of glucose, since it's only in the absence of glucose that cyclic AMP is made. Consequently, efficient transcription of a wild-type template only occurs in the presence of CRP, and that's just as we expect, since RNA polymerase cannot recognize the poor Pribnow box in the wild-type promoter without help. So far, then, the experiment recapitulates what we already knew. The important new finding from this experiment is the result obtained when transcription was carried out with RNA polymerase lacking the alpha subunit CTD. In this case, we find that CRP is unable to stimulate transcription of the wild type promoter when it's presented with an RNA polymerase that's lacking the CTD. This is evidence then that the interaction between AR1 and the RNA polymerase CTD plays a functional role in activation of the wild type LAC promoter. So the experiments I've described in this video support a recruitment model in which an energetically favorable contact between AR1 of CRP and the CTD of the RNA polymerase alpha subunit activates the LAC promoter by increasing the affinity of RNA polymerase for the promoter. I think we have to say, however, that while these experiments are consistent with this model, they fall short of actually proving the model. So I'll leave you with the following question. What additional experiments are needed to prove the recruitment model.